Hello, I'm Amanda Moore. I'm the director of the Clearinghouse Community. Welcome to the Advocacy Exchange for June 2017. The Advocacy Exchange is our monthly conversation with advocates advancing change. And both the Advocacy Exchange and the Clearinghouse Community are brought to you by the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Law, a national leader in advancing justice and opportunity. And I am thrilled today to have with me as a guest, Vidhi Joshi. Vidhi is just down the road from me in Nashville, Tennessee. She's a Scadden Fellow at the Legal Aid Society of Middle Tennessee in the Cumberlands. Um, and I'm in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So hello, Vidhi. Thanks for being with us. Hi, Amanda. Thanks for having me. So Vidhi wrote this month's Clearinghouse article. It's called Legal Aid with Conviction, How to Combat Barriers to Reentry Using the Law. And you can find it at the address here on your screen, povertylaw.org slash clearinghouse. It's a, a longer article than our usual fare, but that's because it's a comprehensive look at the legal barriers that could face our clients when they're coming out of the criminal justice system. Um, and also some of the possible state and federal hooks that you can use to take down those barriers and break the poverty to prison cycle. So that's what we're going to talk about with Vidhi today. Before we get started with that, though, I'd like to let you know how you can be part of this conversation. We would love to hear from you. There are a couple ways you can uh, let us hear from you. One is if you're watching this on the live stream through YouTube Live, you'll see to the right of your screen, if you're on a laptop or a desktop, there is a, a box called Live Chat. And you can send your questions to us there. Um, if you want to go ahead and give it a try, we feel free to do so. Um, you can just send us your name and where you're watching. Um, but we do hope that you'll send us your questions or comments or your own stories while we're talking today. Um, if live chat is not your thing, you can stick with good old fashioned email. My email address is here on the screen. It's Amanda Moore, M-O-O-R-E, at povertylaw.org. Feel free to send an email anytime during the broadcast um, and I will keep a, an eye, eye out for that um, and pass your questions along. So everyone who registered for today's broadcast will receive a follow-up email in the next couple of days. Um, be on the lookout for that email. It will contain a link to watch the recording of today's broadcast, as well as the link to Vidhi's article, so you can see uh, in more detail what we're talking about today. There will also be a link to register for next month's advocacy exchange. But now let's talk about the article uh, and about re-entry. So Vidhi, I just want to start off by asking why as attorneys uh, for civil issues, for people who live in poverty, why should we be concerned with re-entry legal issues? Well, generally speaking, I think mass incarceration is a civil rights issue of our time. And so lawyers have historically played a very important role um, in advancing <clears throat> civil liberties, civil rights um, issues. So, you know, generally speaking, it's just an important issue that lawyers need to be aware about and pushing forward and challenging some of these um, harmful laws and harmful effects of mass incarceration. But specifically, I think that um, when people come out of prison, there do seem to be some access to reentry social services. So resume building, um, you know, social services with uh, help with getting into housing and things like that. But legal services has historically kind of not been a part of any of the legal barriers that people face. So it's really important that, um, you know, we are stepping in to fill that gap, whereas because some of the some of these barriers are, in fact, legal and not just, um, you know, where there is no sort of remedy, some of these remedies are legal. Great. And I want to say hi to Adelina in Massachusetts. She let us know she's watching. We're glad you joined us today. Um, so, so in your article, you look at seven broad categories of reentry issues, um, criminal records, employment, housing, criminal justice debt, civil rights restoration, sex offender issues, and health and benefits. Um, we won't be able to get through all those today in our half hour together, um, but I do want to look at a few of them. Um, we covered criminal justice debt last month on the Advocacy Exchange. Um, we had a, a number of webinars within the past year on housing and criminal records, um, and we've had a couple of past advocacy exchanges on expungement type of issues with criminal records. So those aren't going to be my focus today, but viewers, if that's what you want to know about, please ask us those questions. There's no, no reason we can't talk about them again. But today I want to start with employment. 
Um, you mentioned in your article, fair chance, ban the box laws, um, and the remedies that are available in jurisdictions that have those laws on the books. Uh, but you also mentioned an issue that I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about, which is occupational licensing. Um, and you note that the, the American Bar Association has documented 27,254 state occupational licensing restrictions for people who have a criminal record. It's a big number. So that's a, definitely a, a barrier to a successful reentry if there's a big block in the way of getting particular jobs, that many licenses to allow someone to have employment. So what relief is available for a client who is facing this sort of licensing restriction? Sure. Um, there's a couple types of relief available, and it, of course it depends on state law. Um, but usually some, some states have enacted um, something called a Certificate of Employability or Certificate of Rehabilitation. So if that's an option in your state, that's something that advocates should be looking for. And what these certificates usually do is provide some sort of immunity, um, limited immunity to employers for hiring somebody with a criminal record. And it provides immunity from negligent hiring suits um, for hiring somebody with, with a record. Alternatively, if that's not available um, in a person's state, um, another option is just generally representing people at um, hearings. So for example, if somebody has a license and then it's uh, this professional license has been revoked because of a criminal conviction, um, there can be representation at the uh, revocation hearing. Or um, if somebody has been denied, there can be representation at the appeal. Um, because some of the times the reason that the license has not been uh, renewed or revoked is because of very broad language in the statute. And so an, an advocate can kind of make a case as to why this person's crime or past behavior does not necessarily fall within the parameters of the statute or, um, you know, enough time has lapsed where, it, where it's not an issue or, or something like that. Um, those are the two things. And one other thing I forgot to mention, um, going back to the certificates of employability. So it does um, provide this immunity to employers. And then some states also have um, a provision where if the person has obtained that certificate of employability, um, if they're in a state where the state says, if you have X conviction, you can't have this occupational license ever, period. This type of um, certificate actually forces the state to look at your application um, even if previously you would be disqualified, if you have this certificate, then you would be able to actually apply. And if the state denies you that license, you know, it has to be related to the crime or, um, you know, some other, they have to give a reason. It can't just say, oh, you know, you have a background. We, you're not going to get this license. Yeah. So it's almost like ban the box in the way that it just gets you past this first hurdle that otherwise might be just a blanket exclusion. Exactly. Um, I want to say hello to a few more people who are watching. Um, probably too many to rattle off, but we've got Travis at Cornell, Christine uh, with South Jersey Legal Services, the Justice and Accountability Center in New Orleans, um, Ethan and Christina, Leon and Fred, thank you all for joining. Um, we're glad to hear from you, glad you're with us. I wanna talk about one other license issue and that is driver's licenses, um, which is also really tied to someone's ability to find employment after uh, re-entry. Um, you note that I think 86% of Americans drive to work, um, and especially in rural areas or places without a lot of public transportation, being able to, to drive is really essential to being able to have employment and keep it. Um, but a lot of states have restrictions on people being able to get a driver's license if they have a criminal record, even for uh, convictions that were unrelated to a driving offense. Um, so what, what can an attorney do if a client is having trouble um, getting that essential driver's license? Sure. Um, well, I mean, a driver's license is a true lifeline, I think, in many states. So it is a really important issue for our clients. Um, I think the first step really is to just figure out what is impacting the license, why it's been revoked or suspended, which can be a feat in itself. Um, for example, in Tennessee, I think there's like 140 reasons why your license could be revoked, you know. So it's it really is just first pinning down what it is exactly. And then, um, in, in many cases where a person has a criminal record and their license has been revoked, it can it's usually because of unpaid fees or fines um, related to a driving related charge. Or some states like Tennessee has a law that says if you don't pay any of your criminal court costs and fees, 
on any criminal charge, even if it's not related to driving, the state revokes your driver's license one year after the disposition. So a lot of states have similar laws like that, or states have laws that um, you know revoke licenses based on drug charges. So um, if there's something where it's fees and fines related, that's that's an area where a lawyer can 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 make a difference in filing um, a motion to waive those court costs and fees based on indigency. Um, so just kind of looking at, you know, where the issue lies and then if there is a legal, um, a legal remedy like, you know, filing a motion or um, potentially bankruptcy or something like that, um, a lawyer can make a big difference there in getting that license reinstated. Well, so, so both of these remedies we've been talking about pertaining to employment are pretty, um, they're pretty state or local, locally mm -hmm. based, um, but there is one possible avenue for relief that you mention in your article that's not tied to state or local laws, and that is Title VII of the mm -hmm. Civil Rights Act. How is that relevant? How does it apply here? Sure. So Title VII of the Civil Rights Act is a federal law that prohibits discrimination against protected classes in employment actions. And so, you know, at first glance, it seems like if you're a person with a criminal record, that doesn't make you a protected class. How does this apply? And basically, the, the theory is that um, when employers use wholesale, you know, when when employers use um, policies like no felons allowed, or um, you know, no criminal, no felonies, or no misdemeanors, or no criminal records at all, um, those types of policies have a disproportionate impact on people of color because um, you know the people in the criminal justice system are disproportionately affected by, um, or sorry, pe people. Of color are disproportionately affected by um, the effects of the criminal justice system, arrested at higher rates, um, convicted at higher rates, sentenced at, for longer terms. And so um, when an employer uses a criminal background as a screening mechanism, it does in fact disproportionately affect um, people of color. And so the theory is not that the employer is intentionally discriminating, but they have neutral policies that are, are having a um, uh, impact on on people of color, which which in turn would violate um, the the Civil Rights Act. So uh, you know this it, it can really take a really um, intense type of litigation. You know this that that can also be one way of going about it, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a big long drawn out um, you know battle for for attorneys. They can just write a demand letter um, and kind of cite this guidance that the EEOC has promulgated back in 2012 that specifically states, you know, employers are not allowed to have these blanket bans and that, you know, these are the criteria employers need to be taking when they are creating these policies. And so um, just kind of citing that guidance, which is cited in the article and referenced in the article and stating, hey, my, you know, my client was denied employment. Um, the reason was that you guys have a no felon policy. Here's the guidance. It sounds like you may be violating federal law. I, you know, strongly suggest you take another look at this applicant. Um, and then, you know, if it goes on from there, you know, lawyers, um, civil legal aid attorneys can partner with law firms and, um, you know, really pursue this type of litigation. Well, thank you. Thank and you. I want to remind um, our viewers that we would love to hear from you and hear your questions. You can send us a question through the live chat in YouTube Live, or you can email me here at Amanda Moore at povertylaw.org. And that's M O O R E. Um, I want to talk now about an issue that few people want to discuss, and that's sex offenders. Um, what specific barriers and remedies are there for um, that that attorneys should know about if they have a client who has been convicted of a sex offense? Sure. Um, well, I mean, these clients I feel the worst for because nobody wants to deal with somebody that has a sex offense. Um, I think there is a lot of stigma that surrounds these types of convictions and unfortunately um, they're you know very ostracized and so there really is no way for them to reintegrate themselves even if they have you know taken steps to rehabilitate themselves and are really working toward um, getting back into stable housing and employment so it's a really important issue that I think you know we do need to be looking at um, and another point is that not necessarily you know all sex offenses aren't created equal and so um, sometimes somebody may have a sex offense, which, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that they have, you know, committed some heinous act, but it may be a result of their homelessness or poverty. 
um, that has caused caused them to um, have this conviction. So the restrictions are many uh, when it comes to people with sex offenses. Um, there's housing restrictions, there's employment restrictions, there's monitoring where um, people have, you know, satellite monitoring or little um, trackers on them. There's a lot of check-in um, restrictions. So, you know, they have to check in with an officer once a month. Um, and there's also some monetary impositions where you have to kind of pay to register, um, you know, once a year, pay an annual fee to be on the sex offender registry. Um, so, and I also have a client right now who is on the sex offender registry who is getting harassed by people in the town um, with his name, you know, get being written everywhere. And so it, it can be a, a big a big issue. There's a lot of legal restrictions and they're just societal, you know, stigma and restrictions. So um, the biggest thing is that if you have a client that is eligible for removal off of your state sex offender registry, um, looking into that, um, what, you know, so, and, and it's all state specific as to whether somebody can get off of a registry or not. Some types of crimes, people have to be on the registry for life, but other times they are eligible after five years or 10 years. And so looking at what the um, statute requires for a person to get removed off of the registry. And then, um, so assisting in that process. And then if a person is denied removal, um, there may be an appeals process. So for example, in Tennessee, um, a denial is actually reviewed in Chancery Court, um, Interstate Court. So, um, you know, representing them on that appeal as well. And that's a really great chance for attorneys to create some case law because a lot of these a lot of the times these cases don't actually get to um, court you know people apply on their own low-income individuals or you know people that don't have access to attorneys and so they get a denial from removal and then it just kind of sits and nobody really gets to challenge well the law says x about removal and i don't see why this person doesn't fall into that it's ambiguous let's tease it out and kind of you know get some case law really explaining how the law works so it's a good opportunity for that as well. Let's um, let's talk about another one of the the seven topics that you um, talk about in your article, and that's voting rights and and restoration of civil rights in general. Is an attorney needed there for um, that piece of reentry? It really depends. It really depends on the state. Um, some states it's quite simple and automatic. Um, you can just kind of. Um, and some of the restoration is automatic after a certain period of time, you're able, you no longer have that, um, your rights stripped away. And so you just need to re-register with your local election commission and other states like Tennessee, the process is, is um, very complicated and it depends when your conviction was and what type of conviction it was and what type of sentence you had and um, how, you know, have you paid all your fines and fees and all that type of stuff. So depending on where you are, even if you're just looking to get your voting rights restored, um, the person may need assistance with taking care of their fines and fees first, getting um, caught up on child support payments and any other monetary obligations they have in addition to, um, you know, completing parole and probation as well. So um, in those instances, there may, there may be um, the necess necessity to file a petition in court or something like that. So in those instances, yes. Um, you would need an attorney. There could be uh, the possibility of opposition from a DA or something like that as well. So sometimes they can get contested dependent on the state. And so that's something um, where <clears throat> if there is a petition or, or more formal judicial process, an attorney would, would definitely be recommended. Um, thank you. We've had a question come in from Haas. Um, the question is, how should we address HUD's Office of General Counsel guidance? The application of the Fair Housing Act standards to the use of criminal records um, by providers of housing. This is the, the April 4th, 2016 guidance. I know there, there have been a couple. Um, yeah. And the question is, is there a model for responding to that? Um, and I'll just say before uh, you answer, Vidi, is that um, be sure to check out Vidi's article, which is, you can find at the address on your screen, which is povertylaw.org slash clearinghouse. Um, all the issues we're talking about today, there's a lot more detail in that article along with citations. Um, and we have also had some other items on the clearinghouse previously that are particular to that guidance. And we'll be sure to link to those in the follow-up so you can uh, make sure you have those. Um, but now, Vidi, please answer. So sorry, could you repeat that? It was just how to how to interpret or apply the guidance and right. Is there a model for how you address that guidance basically when you're um, working with this? How how does it come into play? How do you use it? I think is is the question. 
Yeah, so I have I haven't used I've only used it once and basically the idea is to just kind of cite the guidance when um, it's been a, a private landlord that's denied committee admission into housing and they cite that they have, you know, a no no felon policy or no criminal records policy and it's kind of the same type of letter that you would use in the EEOC guidance um, in the EEOC letter and just kind of stating, you know, here's here's this guidance from HUD. It explains why you cannot have these types of blanket bl blanket bans. My client, you know, is a person of color. These types of policies affect him or her disproportionately. Um, and then also, you know, just give some sort of rehabilitation information, you know, give give some facts to your client, explain their story and say, you know, I urge you to take a second look at this, uh, reevaluate your decision. And then um, from from there, if, you know, depending on how it goes, cite the guidance, explain how it works, um, the legal process works, which is the test that they have in the guidance. And then from there, if that doesn't, you know, go forward, then the next step would be to file a complaint. And there have been some good complaints recently, you know, kind of citing that guidance. And we can um, give some of those, you know, citations to those for people to look at if, you know, they want to go ahead and, and are willing to file suit and get some discovery and see um, if there really is a Fair Housing Act violation there. Oh, that's great. Are those are those linked in your article? I can't. They're remember. not, but I can send them. Super. Them okay. So keep, yeah. keep an eye out then on the for the follow up email, and we'll be sure that they're included there and on the page on the clearinghouse for this um, today's broadcast will live uh, in perpetuity. So you'll be able to get those. Thank you for the question. Um, so. Most of the everything that we've talked about so far has been very individual specific um, and focused on you know individual client representation. And I'm wondering if there is room here for a broader kind of impact litigation or impact advocacy of some sort. Um, not necessarily class action because I know uh, you and others have restrictions on that. But is there is there room even with just a couple of clients to to um, have a broader impact? Yes, there is so much room to have a big impact in the reentry world. Um, the the exciting part about this work is that it's new for most um, most organizations and and the law in general. So a lot of these um, statutes that have kind of ambiguous language or terminology haven't really been challenged. So, for example, in Tennessee, we have a law that um, allows a judge to waive fines and fee or fines um, for good cause. Um, what does good cause mean? You know, we had there's not a single case on that uh, so far in Tennessee courts and people are constantly getting denied um, their motions for waiving costs when they are their only income is, you know, SSI and um, or they're homeless and have no other source of income and um, don't have a job. And so there's there's lots of um, there's lots of ambiguous phrases like that throughout um, various parts, you know, whether it comes to expungement or it comes to court cost waivers or, um, you know, even just interpreting kind of amorphous, ambiguous language. Did you, Amanda? Hey, Vinny, are you there? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I could hear you for a second, and then you oh, can hear me sorry. for a second. And then, anyway, we're synced back up now. This is the beauty of a live broadcast, right? Yes. So, um, lots, lots of room for for impact litigation there. Um, another example is for in Tennessee, for example, they are um, courts are not allowing waiver of the expungement fee to get your criminal um, convictions expunged. And so there's, you know, another room for challenge of why is this fee not waivable, um, you know, and, and various challenges like that. So there's plenty of room for impact because this isn't an area where there's going to be a lot of case law in most states or in some states. Right. Well, I know that um, for the past few years, there's been some grant money out there for civil legal aid programs to start some type of re-entry work. Um, I don't know the current status of that, but I'm wondering for if we have any viewers who are interested in this but aren't yet doing this in their programs, what steps they would need to take if this is something they, they want to explore as a possible um, area of practice. Sure. So the first thing I would recommend is just looking at your state to see if there is any, any legal services or any even private attorneys that are doing this type of work. 
to see what types of cases they're seeing. Are, is it driver's license cases? Is it help with expungement? Is it um, more employment litigation? And then depending on you know, what the needs are, then looking for the funding um, surrounding that. So a lot of this work can be tied into you know, perhaps veterans work or um, juvenile advocacy work as well, or transitioning from, um, you know, from custody for juveniles into adulthood. So depending on where the need is, I'm just looking for grant money in that area. Um, there is one grant, a Second Chance Act grant, that is coming up um, in July, and I can send that out, um, where um, the federal government is providing some money as well to do this type of reentry work. I think it, there's, um, a few types of issue areas that they're looking to fund. So that's another, you know, if somebody is ready to go, it's another area to look at or another Great. grant to look at. Yeah. Okay. And so we can also include that in the follow up materials then. Yes. Some mm -hmm. link to that. Super. All right. Well, one thing that I really like about your article is that it. Uh, tries to take a look at the big picture of a client, um, not just one sort of piece of the puzzle of, of re-entry. Um, and so along those same lines I'm, I'm of looking at a big picture of a client situation, I'm wondering about whether there are any outside partners that attorneys need to consider and possibly reach out to when representing a client in a re-entry situation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, first of all, reaching out to your local public defender's office, um, talking to them, seeing what issues they're seeing and working very closely with them. Um, a lot of the times the civil case, um, whether it's an eviction case or, um, you know, another type of civil case moves a lot quicker than the criminal process. And so, you know, being in contact with them to make sure that um, you all are working on an individual's case together to provide them holistic representation. Um, additionally, you know, social service um, workers, so any type of community organizations that are helping people apply to housing, apply to jobs, um, those people are the ones that are going to know um, to call you when they say, hey, I have a client that's been denied from public housing you know, can they do that? And then you can say, well, no, let's, you know, let's take a look at what's going on. Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, so building those relationships is, is really important. And then also community education at any of the local organizations that um, do work with low income individuals to say, hey, the, you know, just because a person has a criminal record doesn't mean that, you know, they're just going to be shunned from society. Here, here is what the law um, says and here's how we can use a lot of help. So if you see these issues, please contact me, um, you know, send me a referral and, and making sure that you're keeping those relationships moving and going. Gotcha. Um, we got an email from Fred. Fred says that the live chat, I guess, has gone dead. So apologies <laughs> for that. But uh, he emailed his question. Um, and which actually is more of a comment, but an important one to make. And he says it's important for criminal defense attorneys to spot reentry issues before incarceration. So, for example, child support can be modified in anticipation of incarceration. And so if that's not done, then the client's going to come out with this huge arrearage, which then leads to, um, you know, a, a kind of a snowball effect of yeah. criminal justice debt and the problems that go with that afterward. That's um, a really so important you, point. Thank you, Fred. Thanks for that. Um, and I uh, want to thank you, Vidi, for your time today. We've reached the end of our time together. This was really interesting. And I want to remind our viewers, there's so much more in her article, um, both just the content and then also the links that she provides. It's a really great piece. So check it out. It's at povertylaw.org slash clearinghouse. And I will put that on the screen. So again, the title is Legal Aid with Conviction, How to Combat Barriers to Reentry Using the Law at PovertyLaw.org slash Clearinghouse. Um, if you liked today's conversation and are interested in topics such as this, please join our mailing list at connect.povertylaw.org slash Clearinghouse. You'll be sure then to be notified of any upcoming uh, events like this and the publications that are on the Clearinghouse. And I will remind you that the Advocacy Exchange is now available as a podcast. So if you miss an episode, but you don't have time to sit in front of the screen to catch up, now you can take the audio with you. You can subscribe to the Advocacy Exchange uh, on iTunes or wherever you subscribe to your podcasts. 
And also just a quick heads up that at the end of this month, we will be sending out a survey to everyone in our clearinghouse community to get your feedback on what we do at the clearinghouse community and how it can best help you in your practice. So please keep an eye on your inbox. And when that survey arrives, we'd really appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to let us hear from you so that we can better serve you. And finally, I'll invite you to join us for next month's Advocacy Exchange. I'll be joined by Ann Porath and Rachel Riemenschneider of the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, and we'll talk about how they have built a successful pro bono program there by recruiting and supporting retired and late career attorneys. They call it ACT II. Um, our conversation will take place on Wednesday, July 19th, at the same time as today, 1 o'clock Eastern and 10 o'clock Pacific. And so we hope that you will join us next month. And until then, please remember that you're not alone out there. Thank you.